You saw him in four episodes of Rural Water Supply, the series that got more than 16 million views. He taught lessons on burp drafting, multiple intake drafting, evaluating sources, and shallow source drafting. Andy Sakadato is our guest today, and he shares expert advice we didn't cover in the series, like the above ground loop and intake to intake pumping, plus bonus burp drafting tips. Plus, he finally tells us the story behind the famous bowling pin. It's episode nine of the Fully Involved Podcast. Man, it's great to catch up with the most popular man at FDIC. I don't know about that. Andy Sacadato. Uh, Andy, the response to Rural Water Supply um, has been incredible. And uh, we actually have two members of the Rural Water Supply cast with us today. Uh, can you introduce us to our special guest that we <laughs> oh, yeah, have below yeah. the table? Yeah. Bam! Oh, oh pin. Yeah, the bowling so. pin. So tell me, why does this appear so much in Rural Water Supply? We Anytime I post a video of this, <laughs> it gets people like, bowling pin, and then they'll be like, is that an NFPA approved? They'll say, it's PBA approved. <laughs> yeah, bowling that's right. So uh, I can't take credit for this. Um, a good friend of mine and a uh, fellow instructor, uh, Keith Thomas, uh, showed me this trick years ago. But um, Keith is a firefighter with the city of Columbus, Ohio. And um, he showed me that in the city of Columbus and a lot of places up in Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, they use bowling pins as their mallets for a couple reasons. The, the first and most obvious is they're pretty cheap. Um, you can go to the bowling alley and either get, you know, pins that were a little jacked up uh, for free or pay, you know, very, very, very little money to get a box of pins. But what I love about it is they're, they're fairly ergonomic, right? The weight is all up here, uh -huh. so I can swing nice and easy. I can turn around in those tight spots and go ahead and, and get that ear if I'm, I'm doing that. Um, and the weight is perfectly balanced in my opinion. But what I really love about it is even when I miss my connection, I'm still making contact. So, so that helps because, um, you know, <laughs> It, not everything is perfectly accurate when we're on the rural fire ground. But the best part about this thing, especially for rural water supply stuff, is when my clumsy self drops this thing into the water source, it'll float. Uh -huh. Whereas mallets will sink to the bottom and I'll lose them. Um, so because this is a wood core, Perfect. it'll float even when you drop it in the water. So it can also be thrown into a dump tank and help prevent your whirlpools from forming. So multi-use, multi, multi -use, it looks a little barbaric and backwards, um, but it's something that uh, a, a great fireman showed me and it, it means a lot to me, so I, I like to show other people. That's amazing. Here, I gotta so. get a quick shot here. <laughs> Can you see this? <laughs> on the video. <laughs> uh, Andy, you, World War Supply generated millions and millions of impressions, comments, shares. Just what's the response been on your end? How often do people say, man, I've been seeing your videos? Um, it has been unbelievable. I, I honestly, when we filmed it, I didn't know what to expect. I kind of thought, um, well, I mean, maybe somebody will find this useful. Because you're humble, that's why. Well, <laughs> I, I hope I am. I try to be. <laughs> Um, but the number of people that have come up to me and said, hey, we've watched your videos and it has helped us so much. Or what I've loved even more is, hey, we watched the video and then we went outside and tried it and it worked. What right? was a, what's an example of a time where somebody said, we implemented what you did? Yeah, Can so a story? I've, uh, I, was teaching, I was teaching in Angola, Indiana. Um, it was fairly uh, shortly after the series had dropped. And I had taught a class and, and we talked about the videos. I think I may have even showed one, but uh, the group uh, uh, of folks in that class walked out afterwards and they texted me uh, about a week later. They're like, hey, we watched, watched the burp drafting video. We went outside and we did it uh, after, you know, we'd never had burp drafted before and we got it right away and that now we're teaching it. So um, that was really cool and I, <laughs> I want to be honest, it's it's not all me or Henry, right? What you did, editing oh, and putting thanks. everything thanks. together, right? Like, that's the magic. I was just the clown that was talking. 
<laughs> um, you the it's way not true, but thank you. You yeah. put it together the way that the fire service can understand it and make uh, use of it. Oh, man. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times uh, people have come to me and said those checklists are really super helpful. Really? Yeah. T- tell me more about that. Why? So I was teaching a class in um, um, West Virginia, Moundsville, West Virginia, and Moundsville's right on the Ohio River. So there were folks from Ohio in the class. And one of the guys who is uh, part of the Ohio Water uh, TAC group, um, his name's Jim Delman, he came to me and they brought their water supply support trailer. And he had every single checklist printed out and laminated and said, hey, just just so you know, we keep this on our trailer and we keep it on our engines and our fire department. So that way, uh, if we need a reference, I can look up, okay, this is how you burp draft and and this is this is whatever. So, um, yeah, something that I I don't even remember how the checklists came about. uh, If we were talking about doing it or if it was an idea you had or maybe we were. I think it was a collaborative effort. We'd been kicking around. I was like, you know what? This is kind of, there's, you know, you make it simple, but there's still some steps. And this is, some of this stuff is not, you know, intuitive. So why not just make it easy for people and put every step on a check? I, I love printing stuff out and having a hard copy or pulling it up on my phone, but. I need a step-by-step, you know, guide. And yeah. so I thought, wouldn't that be helpful to people? And so I'm thrilled to hear that people have been using them. What I love about it from a personal standpoint, um, you know, like the burp drafting video in its entirety, that thing is like 15 minutes long. So there's a lot of good information, but I mean, you know, as well as I do, not everybody can pay attention <laughs> for 15 minutes. Right. So having the, the meat and potatoes where I can read this list. Okay, step one is X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Um, so I can go out and just refresh, right? Maybe watch the video real quick and then turn around and say, hey, you know what? Um, this is how I need to need to do it. So it's the, the checklists I think have been a huge success. And it was something that, like you said, I don't think it was necessarily on our original radar when we were filming uh-huh. the series. Man, um, that's awesome. So, so, so yeah. I would love to hear more why so you know i can see on the metrics behind the scenes like certain episodes are way more popular than others why was burp drafting so popular um i I don't know that i necessarily know that answer but um i think i can tell you from what i from when i teach and i show people how to do it people once they do it they're like this is so easy why haven't i been doing this from the beginning right and what problem are they solving when they're burp drafting? uh fa- failed primers right uh, a primer that has failed or even if the primer is not failed some of the challenging more challenging drafting scenarios like drafting off of a bridge with a lot of lift or a really long reach operation where I may have, you know, 60 or 70 foot of sleeve and uh, I'm concerned about burning up a primer or stuff like that. Um, so that, that's the solution that it has. So it, you know, it's kind of threefold. Failed primers, long reach scenarios, or high lifts. That's, that's where it really comes into play and is successful. But um, the other thing too, I think what separates the burp draft video is I have a lot of students that will come and tell me that hey you know what I've done something like that or been taught something similar to that we called it something else primerless prime or bump draft whatever it is but the one varying difference that that I'm glad that we captured and we explained in the video series is a lot of people uh, especially in the burp drafting video a lot of people have been taught to do that technique while flowing a hand line or while flowing the deck gun. And while that will work, it 100% works, mm. um, you're on a timer. So if your deck gun is flowing and your booster tank runs dry, well now you can't burp draft anymore. And then on the flip side, if you're flowing hand lines and you're burp drafting, well now the nozzleman gets those erratic nozzle reactions and we saw that in the video mm-hmm. that, that we captured with the with the guy losing yeah, it and right. coming yeah. back right so so I think that's why the video is so successful because people can see okay this is how I was doing it 
this guy and TFT is saying use your tank fill as the way to move the water and it solves all those problems mm -hmm. and and it's quick and I don't have to worry about anything um, so so yeah curious you know your brain is moving a hundred miles a minute <laughs> uh, I'm sure there were moments where you're like you know what we did do eight great episodes but I really wish if I could have done a ninth episode I really wish we could have covered what what was that the, the next one we would have done or maybe we'll do in the future yeah so um, I think the major things we covered just about everything that was on my wish list for rural water um, what we didn't get into was more on the hydrant side mm -hmm. um, you know we did the Oasis series which mm -hmm. um, we did those five episodes yeah, right but I know originally I had thought that we had the potential to do a hydrant water supply series as well, uh -huh. where we can talk about heavy hydrant hookups using not the Oasis valve, but three supply lines off the hydrant, what that does, um, showing people and developing a, a video on intake to intake pumping or dual pumping as some people call it. Um, there's a lot of people that don't understand that or, or uh, have a hard time visualizing it and I think with what we were able to do and the graphics that we did with Rural Water and even the, the four-way valve series um, that would shed a lot of light on that that tactic as well. So um, tell me about the pro like let's just start from the beginning with that tactic what's the problem that you're, you're experiencing as a firefighter that would make you want to do that? Yeah so the typical problem is I'm on a fire scene, I'm the attack piece. Attack piece has a water supply, and let's say there's a, there's a pumper on that water source that is pumping to the attack engine. So this engine at the fire scene has water, has good water, but another apparatus comes from a different direction, whether it be a quint or a, another engine, something like that, and they're operating at the fire scene as well, but they need a, a water supply as well. A lot of fire departments in America will do one of two things. That third arriving engine or quint, they will pick up their own water, so lay out from a separate hydrant and, and do it that way. Does that work? Certainly works, but it's more hose on the ground. Or engine one that's operating at the fire scene will pump directly to engine two. And with those two rigs sitting right next to each other, nose to nose, that also accomplishes the the task but engine one doesn't have to pump at a high pressure to get water you know a hundred foot to mm -hmm. the next rig but they're probably pumping at a high pressure for their attack lines or whatever else they're doing so they're gonna have to gate back the supply feeding this rig and it becomes a balancing act is a pain in the butt the easier option is to go rather than discharge to intake from one to three what I can do is go intake to intake, and now the residual water and residual pressure from the system flows through the first engine and goes into the other rig, and that engine gets the volume at a much lower pressure, and every rig has the ability to uh, manipulate their throttles and have full control of their discharges. So. What's the biggest misunderstanding about what you just described? Um, so the biggest misunderstanding is that uh, the second engine will rob water from the first engine. Um, and that's not true. Uh, uh, the, the engine that's being dual pumped is receiving the leftovers or residual water. So residual water means what is left over, what's not being used. So if engine one is flowing 500 gallons a minute, and the, the water supply is providing them with 1,500 gallons per minute, the unused 1,000 GPM is shown on engine one's um, uh, master intake gauge as residual intake pressure. That means that I can now share it with engine two over here, and engine two has access to the unused water. But if engine one continues to flow or starts flowing water, that just removes water available for engine two to use. Engine two is the, uh, the little brother who gets the hand-me-downs, <laughs> right? Um, big brother always gets first pick. Big brothers, and you, you and I are both That's big right. brothers. That's <laughs> right. We get first pick, little brother gets the hand-me-down. Now, and that kind of leads into the next kind of video that I thought yeah. we could have done right. or could do is 
the the disadvantage to that system is it's a one directional flow so engine two loses water it doesn't lose water um it is the end of the line he gets the last pick mm -hmm. so the way i build that out and make it more advantageous for everybody is i create what's called an above ground loop so now we have a fourth engine come from the engine up here and they lay out to a separate hydrant and now i got two engines down at hydrants pumping to the two engines that are at the fire scene and i literally create an above ground loop right there and Man. both engines have all the water. You're so full of knowledge. Um, <laughs> you live outside of the digital ecosystem. In fact, most of your time is spent training firefighters. What's your message to a firefighter who's watching this video and wants to train with you? How can they get involved with the Water Thieves? Yeah, so uh, a couple options. The, the best thing is first off, follow us on social media. Um, we, we try to do our best. Um, posting all of our trainings and giving some synopsis on um, our trainings and what we're doing in them. Um, you can go to our website, uh, thewaterthieves.com, and uh, click on a link to request a quote to see if uh, you know we can come and teach for your fire department. Or you can go and purchase uh, my book from Fire Engineering Books, Water Thievery, The Art of Water Supply Operations. All of this information, everything that we talked about in the video series, uh, both video series is in that book and there's data and numbers to prove it. So, Awesome. Well, Andy, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. And can't wait to get down to Tennessee and uh, train with you some more. Heck yeah. Thank Th you, Gordon. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. If you want to get the gear to take your rural water supply operations to the next level, head to tft.com demo and get your hands on the equipment to help you perform at your best.